Hello, Dr. Prabhakar. Could you hear me? Uh, hi. Hi. I uh, just wanted to know maybe if we could also test your video and screen sharing options. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Are you able to see my uh, screen now? Yes, yes, looks good. I uh, will also have it open from our end just in case there is a technical glitch and we have to share it. Yeah, no problem. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jayatunga. Hi, Hi, Dr. Jayatunga. Okay, uh, fine. Uh, Everything uh, looks good. Um, mm -hmm. Just to let everyone know, uh, thank you for joining and uh, just a few regular housekeeping uh, rules for the day. We have uh, one of our Google Forms out uh, for registrations. I will drop it in the chat. If everyone could um, kindly fill that out, it would be great so we get an understanding of who's in the room with us. Uh, furthermore, it would be great if everyone could also rename yourselves to indicate your name and the country you're joining us, uh, joining us from. Uh, so that we could uh, better prepare for the breakout group. Thank you. Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our fourth and final day of our workshop series on climate and disaster risk management, risk transfer and related laws and policies. Today's workshop will focus on inclusive and participatory climate and disaster insurance and we are really glad to have uh, some to have a really great lineup of speakers uh, with us today as well as uh, participants who have actually been with us some most of uh, the participants on the list have been with us for the past three days and it's always nice to see you all back so thank you very much for joining um hello to everyone from facebook thanks for joining in from there uh just to maybe let everyone know on a few uh, regular housekeeping uh, rules that we have here on zoom so please do keep yourself mute at all times uh, just so you know we can avoid minimum uh, noise and distraction and if possible maybe turn on the video during the discussion and uh, not when uh, there's anyone speaking so that you know the focus will be on the presenter uh, also kindly i would request everyone to maybe rename yourself on zoom to indicate your name and the country you're joining us from so that we can better prepare for the breakout group and finally, there is registration form for the day. That is a form on Google uh, Forms, actually. I will drop that on the chat again. I would kindly request everyone to also fill that out. So with that said, I would now like to start today's proceedings and would like to invite Dr. Sunimal Jatung, the additional secretary to the Ministry of Environment, Sri Lanka. And just one more uh, note um, of uh, thanks and gratitude, Dr. Jatung, the Ministry of Environment, they've been with us for the past four days giving us their time very generously. So thank you, Dr. Jatunga, for giving us your time and for being here and for supporting the work that we do here at Slide and Trust. Uh, thank you and over to you. Uh, thank you, Shinasia, and good afternoon to everyone and also good morning uh, who are joining from other regions. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, let me appreciate uh, Ms. Vosita Vijayanayake executive director of strike and trust and her team for organizing this timely event and inviting me to share sri lankan 
experience on disaster risk management and disaster risk transfer uh, as the former director of climate change who engaged in uh, many climate change uh, initiatives to be uh, launched in the country including national adaptation plan national climate change policy and national nationally determined contributions and many other more i am happy to join uh, this forum um, climate change is um, one of the key key threats if not the uh, bigger threat faced by the planet Sri Lanka is among the countries most vulnerable to climate change and climate risk management is a key aspect that needs to be addressed in Sri Lanka. As one of the key risk management mechanisms, climate and disaster risk insurance plays a key role. In Sri Lanka, uh, there has been uh, an insurance system that focuses on mainly the agriculture sector, which relates to hazards such as floods and droughts since the uh, 1960s. So very old now, more than 60 years. Uh, this product has developed over the years and is implemented by the government to ensure that uh, impact of climate and disasters which hinder the agriculture sector are addressed. Additionally, uh, there are also compensation schemes and disaster related insurance schemes, which focuses which focus on uh, climate and disaster risks faced by the country. Uh, the policies and plans that relate to climate change, including the uh, NDCs of Sri Lanka and National Adaptation Plan, which was submitted uh, to UNFCCC uh, in 2015, highlight the insurance scheme under the loss and damage NDCs. Uh, this includes the enhancement of uh, existing process, as well as the engagement of different actors who work in uh, risk transfer related activities to identify how insurance process would lead to address climate and disaster risk, as well as contribute to covering the losses and damages incurred. The national mechanisms for Warsaw International Mechanism, which is also a commitment under the NDCs, will also cover elements which um, relate to this focus area through the focus on risk management financial systems to address losses and damages additionally the the ndcs and the national adaptation plan of sri lanka focus on the theme of risk transfer uh, Dr. Jayatangar. Yeah, hello? Okay, yes, now we can hear you. Ah, okay. Um, through the areas related to resilience building and, and, and the key elements related to inclusive risk management and transfer would be considered under the multi stakeholder initiatives. Hello? Yes, Dr. Jackson, can hear you. Could be, could be considered under the multi-stakeholder initiatives, which will be linked to the implementation of actions related to nationally determined contributions and the National Adaptation Plan of Sri Lanka. However, uh, there is space for scaling up the activities the crop insurance as well as the disaster relief provided are due to the aggravating losses and damages in need of being increased. This would need multi-actor actions, which will help the process to be scaled up and effectively implemented. The government, the private sector, 
civil society organizations, communities infected by climate change impacts, including youth and women, uh, need to be engaged in identifying the needs to be addressed, the designing of products, as well as decision making related to addressing climate and disaster risks. This would contribute to making the solutions offered to be owned by the communities who are facing the strong impacts of climate change, whose livelihoods are badly impacted, as well as those who need to play a vital role in uh, delivering uh, solutions to uh, reduce disaster risk and uh, risk transfer. Uh, in this respect, uh, we need to also improve the capacity and the and technical expertise of all actors. Dr. Jayatanda. Uh, better or best, the risk calculations and the data needs to setting up products and systems that will not hinder addressing vulnerabilities. Systems that take into consideration these aspects will contribute towards the development process of a country and reduce the existing vulnerabilities and risks. To achieve this, it is important that all actors work together, that gaps and needs are addressed and decision-making processes take into consideration in to address them through a collective actions. The collective and part climate risks will contribute to building sustained and long-term resilience, which will help vulnerable communities, ecosystems, countries to achieve sustainable development and face the threats of climate change. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jayatanga, and uh, thank you once again to the Ministry of Environment of Sri Lanka for being uh, been an active uh, party, will contribute, and also for like supporting our work through and through, and especially it's been a very good class for the year. So thank you, Dr. Jayatanga, Dr. Jayatanga is the additional secretary to the Ministry of Environment of Sri Lanka. So thank you once again for your time. So moving on uh, to our second, and just to let everyone know, just again, you this of my housekeeping tools for today. So please do rename yourself on Zoom if possible to indicate your name and the country you're joining us from. So this will better help us prepare for the breakout groups. Furthermore, uh, please do complete the registration form for the day. I will uh, drop that on the chat as well. And uh, also, if there's anyone joining us from Facebook, uh, if in, on for those here on in the main plenary, if you have any questions for the speakers, uh, please do uh, drop them on the chat now or hold on to them until we open up for our Q and A a bit later. So moving on to our second speaker, I would like to invite Mr. Lucas Shonak. I hope you pronounced that right. He is the senior business developer at Descartes Underwriting. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot uh, for having me. Um, very interesting. Um, perhaps shortly about myself. I was previously at the GIZ, the German Development Corporation. Uh, perhaps some people know it. I was also working for some time in India. So it's very nice to uh, have this workshop here now with uh, you on the climate risk and the disaster insurance in uh, Sri Lanka. Um, perhaps I will shortly. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Lucas, sorry to come in, but yeah. uh, would you be able to maybe try that without your video because there's a, the, your audio keeps breaking a bit. Sure, right. sure, pleasure. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe I briefly talk about the card underwriting, uh, what we do specifically, and then talk about our ambitions for climate and disaster risk insurance. So um, the card underwriting is a managing general agency, uh, which has the goal to support governments and uh, companies 
the business sector really to uh, increase their climate and disaster resilience with uh, very, uh, I would say, AI-driven risk modeling approaches and uh, parametric insurance in particular. So uh, parametric insurance, it was something that was born out of the development context, as we may all know. Um, it basically covers an event instead of the traditional um, damages on the ground. It just basically estimates it and uh, uh, precise you do the work up front, uh, the better your modeling is, the more accurate the payouts will be um, for what the people need on the ground in the end. Um, so obviously there is always quite some basis risk involved that a payout in case of a, a cyclone or in case of a tsunami may be uh, too large or, or too low, but this is a sort of part of the package, I would say, with uh, parametric insurance. Um, perhaps what's interesting is that uh, obviously 2020 was quite an unprecedented uh, market phase due to on one side COVID, but also because the, the market, the insurance market has experienced quite uh, hardening, um, which means that uh, less and less capital is available for um, risk transfers, which means that um, in the end, a lot of uh, companies or uh, entities that are looking for insurance capacity are no, uh, are no longer able to afford it or to even have access to insurance capacity. So what, for example, we have experienced in the US a lot or in Europe was that many players um, basically have uh, reduced their capacity and uh, then companies from one day to the other learned about that, okay, instead of uh, 30 million for hurricane, for example, we only have 5 million in insurance capacity. And that obviously fosters quite a protection gap and is quite an issue of underinsurance. And um, from what I understand, this uh, trend is less um, uh, less common right now in uh, Asia. So where the market hardening is not that tough as compared to Europe or the US, but still I think that some of the lessons we learned from this um, can be also applied to risk transfer uh, management and disaster management in the, in the development context. And the main lesson which I would basically like to share is really that with uh, parametric insurance and traditional insurance in a combination that there can be a very, very good um, benefit uh, for, for all players involved. There can be nice win to win situations. It always depends on a case by case, of course. But uh, what we really experienced is that when uh, companies are facing uh, lack in protection, uh, under insurance, for example, as I mentioned, hurricanes, cyclones, then a parametric insurance can scoop in very well. Um, we can, for example, cover a certain shortfall of uh, capacity where we say, for example, okay, um, a certain company in Sri Lanka needs more um, capacity uh, above the 5 million, perhaps that the traditional insurer has given them. And that's something where parametric insurance can then really uh, tailor something very specifically to the needs of the respective company or the respective uh, government. And that's a bit of what uh, we are trying to do at the card underwriting to find uh, proper solutions for very hard to insure risks. So it's, uh, it's a task that is, uh, I would say, very R&D specialized in some contexts. Uh, in some cases. So for example, if especially in, in Sri Lanka or in other Southeast Asian countries, um, we, we often face a, a issue with the data availability, for example. Um, this is something where satellite data can help uh, tremendously and uh, we usually rely a lot on uh, satellite data to underwrite our uh, uh, policies. But of course, for example, for other things like um, monsoon, where uh, satellites have a very hard time to capture floods through the uh, uh, clouds, um, we have to rely on weather stations. 
and such a weather station network is oftentimes quite underdeveloped in uh, some parts of the world, I would say. So this is something where uh, I think um, there can be still some uh, improvement to uh, better uh, to really to improve the access to insurance capacity, because when the technology is here, um, then uh, parametric insurance and the traditional capacities can work very well together to um, basically offer the best terms to um, governments and to businesses in, in certain parts of the world, which may face some issues right now to uh, secure the much wanted uh, insurance capacity. And that's uh, just a brief scope from my side. Uh, I hope I didn't break up during, the, during my little talk, but of course, happy to look forward, uh, looking forward to the discussion then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lucas uh, Shonak. He is the Senior Business Development at Descartes Underwriting. And uh, now we move on to a presentation from Ms. Linda Siegel, who's actually been with us for the past three days, uh, two days as well, uh, sharing her insights and knowledge on uh, the topic. She is a PhD candidate at the University College of London Faculty of Laws. Um, Ms. Siegel, why, why don't you turn on your mic and camera? I would also like to maybe request everyone once again who's taking part to kindly rename yourself on Zoom if you haven't already, and also to complete the registration form that we have for the day. We have 19 respondents so far, and I think we have a few more to go. Um, Shalini, will you be sharing Ms. Siegel's screen? Um, thank you, Sanasha, and, and, and to the, the uh, Slycon Trust team for in inviting me for so many days of, of um, contributions to the workshop. It's truly been enriching for me, and, and I've learned an awful lot um, uh, over these last couple of days. What, what I've been asked to do by um, the organizers is to give a, sh a snapshot of what um, uh, financing looks like for loss and damage under the UNFCCC, the Climate Change Convention. Um, and I, I believe this is not the right presentation. Um, right. Just uh, give me a minute, Linda. Let me just... That's okay. <clears throat> so what I will be doing is, is giving you a very um, quick, quick overview of uh, where finance that's it, great. Um, where loss and damage finance um, is under the UNFCCC um, convention, um, some specifics around um, timelines and in, in looking at um, different financial instruments for uh, uh, addressing loss and damage. And, and because we're looking at insurance and participatory insurance models, um, I will do my best to bring in those, those two um, specific topics as we go forward. What I just wanted to do was g give you a, a little bit of a sense of the level of detail that um, parties to the convention look at when they, when they consider finance issues around loss and damage and where the real work on detail happens. So we have a few COP decisions. These aren't all of the COP decisions around loss and damage, but these are some of the main ones that look that have financial pro provisions for loss and damage. Um, the first one, um, 3CP18, is a COP decision that um, asks uh, developed countries to provide financing for developing countries in addressing their adaptation needs. Currently, um, loss and damage concerns sit under the broader rubric of adaptation in the convention. Um, then we go to a, a year later in 2013, where we have um, the, the Warsaw International Mechanism established, and one of its functions in, is to enhance action and support, including finance, um, for addressing loss and damage. Um, and, and there are some more general um, financing pr provisions in that decision. And then finally, the 2016 decision 
um, which is the first time that the Warsaw International Mechanism was reviewed, um, asks the Secretariat, the UNFCCC Secretariat, to prepare a technical paper on sources of finance for loss and damage um, in advance of, of the second review of, of the WIM, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, and also um, during this uh, review in 2016, there was an envisioning of, of some sort of expert group on action and support um, to look at not only finance for loss and damage, but technical um, uh, support and capacity building support as well. Um, to move on with the legal provisions, um, the Paris Agreement um, has a, a specialized article on loss and damage, Article 8. And within that, uh, the provisions of that article, um, parties are asked to enhance their understanding, um, action, and support on, uh, on a cooperative basis and facilitative basis, um, including in areas of risk insurance facilities, climate risk pooling, and other insurance solutions. So some specific, um, much more specific provisions in the Paris Agreement around uh, risk transfer and insurance. Um, we moved to 2019, which was the last COP we had, face-to-face um, -face COP in any case, um, where there was a second review of the Warsaw International Mechanism. The decision coming out of that review process has a number of provisions on finance for loss and damage, um, but, but they're, they're sort of a, a, an unclear uh, line of, of obligations for who um, should be providing that finance and, and when and where that finance should manifest itself. On a more positive level, uh, the review reinforced the links between um, the work on loss and damage under the convention and various other financial uh, bodies in the, under the convention, namely the Standing Committee on Finance and uh, the operating entities of the financial mechanism, the Green Climate Fund and the Global Environment Facility. Um, and finally, um, called for the establishment of a special expert group on action and support. And that, that expert group has formally been established um, and is, is, is in the process of, be, of becoming operationalized. So at the, at the international level, parties have talked very generally um, a, a, about finance for loss and damage. The real nitty gritty work and, and the specifics has gone on at, at a, a lower level, I, I suppose you could say, um, under the executive committee of the Warsaw International Mechanism. And I have four bullet points here um, uh, looking at sort of key moments, uh, I would I would call them around um, financing for loss and damage. Uh, the Standing Committee on Finance worked with the XCOM um, to put together a forum on financing uh, for the risk of loss and damage. Um, there was a, a, a an expert dialogue held in May um, to help inform the technical paper um, that was mandated in 2016. Um, that technical paper was published in June of 2019. And as I mentioned, the Action and Support Expert Group, which is now um, uh, happily known as the ASEG. The ASEG was established at the end of last year and is in the process of being operationalized. Yes, thank you. Next slide. Um, so on the next slide, I, I, I've, I've provided a little bit more of a, of a summary of, of some of the outcomes of these, what I call the key moments. I won't go through all of these. Um, I know the organizers will share my slides with you, um, but there are some common themes that I wanted to, to, to pick out here. And one is that there's no one size fits all approach to addressing loss and damage. Um, and that there's no single financial instrument that can, can cover all the risks associated with loss and damage. So insurance is one really important tool and we'll talk about how, how it fits into the current um, mix of financial instruments available, um, but there's a recognition that um, a combination quite often of instruments um, need to be looked at um, and, spe and specific ri risks in different regions need to be considered. Um, so those themes came out in both the SEF form in 2016 and the SUVA expert dialogue. I think one of the things that um, also um, was, was really highlighted during the SUVA expert dialogue, which was just um, 
an informal set of meetings <clears throat> alongside more formal negotiating um, processes in May of 2018, um, that local communities need to be further involved and that their experiences of loss and damage um, should be understood and integrated into risk assessment processes. So that's one of the outcomes of the SUVA expert dialogue. Also, a recognition that insurance tools are, are critical um, to providing uh, protection against extreme weather events, but may not be as appropriate for looking at longer term slow onset impacts. Um, then the technical paper is, is, um, is really a technical paper. It examines um, the, the concept behind loss and damage. And, and I, I think there is a certain level of discomfort um, in the paper itself because there's no, uh, there's no agreed definition of what loss and damage is and loss and, and finance flows for loss for the impacts that may lead to loss and damage have not actually been tagged. And so that the, the authors of the paper needed to look at sort of proxies for <clears throat> what financing for loss and damage meant, i.e. Um, perhaps through adaptation um, finance, financing for adaptation um, and financing for disaster risk management. So there's this, it's still an evolving um, kind of science as it were as to what what is finance for loss and damage? All of these uh, report, the reports from these meetings and the technical paper itself are all available on the UNFCCC Secretariat website and a quick um, uh, information search will get you to, to those, those documents. And I encourage you to, to look through them if you're interested in, in, in uh, uh, going, digging a little deeper. And finally, the, the, the most recent key moment is the XCOMS um, action and support expert group, which um, says December 2012, it's December, sorry, December 2020, that's um, an error there. Um, it's been established and it's in the process of being operationalized. One of the um, initial mandates of that expert group is to analyze and identify enabling conditions for effective implementation of risk, risk transfer facilities, social protection schemes, all in the context of comprehensive risk management. So there is a specific mandate for this expert group to look at insurance related issues. Thank you, next slide. I won't go through all of this in detail because I know that we have time constraints, but I just wanted to give you a sense of um, what sort of, what the inventory of tools or financial instruments available for addressing loss and damage are um, based on, on some of the outcomes of these key moments. So the tools, um, and this is a screenshot from the actual report of the SEF forum. So you, you can, can find this in the SEF forms report um, on the UNFCCC Secretariat's website. It identified uh, four uh, existing financial instruments um, uh, for addressing the risks of loss and damage, risk transfer schemes, which is, is germane to the, the insurance topic that we're discussing today, social protection schemes, catastrophe and resilience bonds and contingency finance. And you can see what the descriptions of those are. I, I won't go into those in, in detail. And then there are some examples of, of what, what those financial instruments look like in, in, in practice. Um, if we could go to the next uh, screen, please. So moving on three years later um, in the technical paper, um, on uh, sources of finance for loss and damage, we see a slightly different reordering of um, tools available. Social protection, which was considered a financial instrument in the 2016 uh, forum report has been moved up to a risk management approach. Um, it's still there, but it's kind of moved axes and um, grant funding uh, has been introduced into um, the types of financial instruments available. I think what's really um, important to consider about this uh, graphic or this figure is not so much the detail, um, but looking at um, the different components of comprehensive risk management, which, which go across the top, the types of financial instruments, existing financial instruments, and the scope that they cover um, and and I think this this drives home the um, 
the uh, uh, conclusion that financial instruments, um, different financial instruments need to be used depending on the risk approach um, being taken um, or that the component of comprehensive risk management that's being looked at. And so that this idea of complementarity and um, and multiple and using multiple in instruments, I think is really well il illustrated in this table. Um, next slide, please. So again, I won't go into too much detail around this slide and the next one, but going back to the 2016 forum report, um, it, it looked at each of the four existing financial instruments that it um, outlined and, and talked about challenges and opportunities. Because we're looking specifically at risk transfer um, instruments, um, including insurance, I, I'll, I'll briefly go through this, this top um, row. Um, but for you to know, this is also part of the forum report, and you can look at this um, in more detail at, at, at your leisure going, going forward. So in terms of risk transfer sch schemes, the challenges that were identified um, in the forum were that they're difficult to apply to slow onset events. They're potentially less suitable for high frequency, low severity events that insurance premiums can be a barrier for vulnerable countries. And certainly if you drill down into um, uh, more vulnerable communities in those vulnerable countries, um, that's an issue. Um, that there's limited access uh, to insurance and a small, uh, potentially limited access and a small percentage of, of populations currently um, are covered in vulnerable countries. Bearing in mind that this was four or five years ago, I think there has been some evolution along those lines. Um, there are opportunities um, that uh, risk transfer schemes are certainly su suitable for sudden onset events, um, that index space and parametric insurance, um, and, and Lucas just spoke about, about that and, and the opportunities there, index-based insurance can reduce administrative costs and result in faster payouts, and that um, uh, it, it, these risk transfer schemes can reduce some of the indirect effects of loss and damage by a, it, improving capacity to respond to losses. So that's just an example of the kind of analysis that was was um, is done um, in the 2016 forum report around these four existing financial instruments. You can see, and yes, thank you. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. You can see that this is done for all all four, um, and and then. Um, it, I, what I think is interesting is, is there are some cross-cutting challenges around um, lack of data, um, difficulty in forecasting and modeling, uh, need for uh, vulnerability and exposure information that's, you know, that's um, substantial and viable, and the need to in, in, embed finance, the use of financial instru instruments into comprehensive risk management strategies. So there are some, some overall challenges and, and barriers there envisioned uh, there. Okay, so what I'd like to do, and, I, and this is in my my mind, the second component of what we're talking about today is look at stakeholder participation as it's as it has been envisioned in these in these key moments um, under the convention around financing for loss and damage. I again won't go into a huge amount of detail. These are these are issues that um, have been discussed over over the four or five years that we've been looking at finance for loss and damage under under the convention. I think the key takeaway. Um, and, 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 and my final uh, reflections will we'll focus on this, is that sustainable solutions require um, government and all relevant stakeholders to be engaged. Um, there has been discussions about who these stakeholders are, public private sector actors, local, national, regional, and international actors, organizations and governments, um, and certainly uh, non-governmental organizations and local communities, and then also looking at who the beneficiaries of, 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 these, um, of these approaches are. Um, the different roles of some of the different actors have been discussed, um, the role of government, the role of finance, fi financial institutions in the private sector, and, and where their skills and, and um, and knowledge lies. 
um, the kind of bridging role that regional and international organizations can play, and then certainly the, the critical role of local communities in, in providing the kind of um, specific knowledge and experience re required to actually um, tailor products that um, address uh, potential losses and damages. I'm not going to go into too much detail about barriers, gaps, and challenges, but this list here primarily comes from the report on the SUVA expert dialogue, which was one of the key moments, um, the, the, the May 2018 SUVA expert dialogue, um, goes through the all of the components of comprehensive risk management and does a really good job of um, laying out where barriers, gaps, and challenges exist. Um, a number of the, these in the list um, relate to uh, participation, lack of awareness of risk at local levels, insufficient capacity to carry out comprehensive risk management approaches, um, the, 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 lack, the inclusion or lack thereof of vulnerable groups in local communities, um, the, the, the challenges around coordination amongst uh, different levels of government um, and certainly familiarity with insurance and, and, and affordability issues. Um, I think the, la the next slide is my last. Yeah, just some reflections um, to try and pull together um, some of these notions around uh, financial instruments, participation, and, um, and looking at loss and damage. Um, financial tools to address loss and damage exist, but financial flows are not currently tagged as addressing loss and damage. They're tagged as addressing adaptation, in, uh, adaptation to impacts of climate change or, or uh, dealing with disaster risk um, reduction or management. Um, there are also gaps in the fi existing financial instruments, especially when it comes to financial tools for addressing slow onset events. Um, and the, the level of participation in designing and implement, implementing these tools may depend upon the level at which they are targeted. Um, and, and usually the different levels range from a regional uh, level to, to a local community level. Um, in, in the interests, and this is my own personal view, in the interests of fairness, effect, effectiveness, and sustainability, there is an argument, I believe, a very strong argument to be made for consistent and sustained participation at each stage of the rollout of, of financial uh, tools for addressing loss and damage. And I, I just, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> so I want to just cap off this, this discussion with looking at how we can bolster that argument for, um, for full participation of all relevant stakeholders by looking at some of the um, key international uh, principles that have been agreed amongst countries, financial and otherwise, that, uh, that I think underlie this notion around participation when, when we are designing financial instruments to address loss and damage. Certainly there are human rights obligations that countries have to their own citizens. The UN Framework Convention, it has a number of, of principles that are relevant. This idea that everyone has a responsibility to address climate change, but, um, but there are different levels of capacity in doing so. Um, so it's inclusive, but, um, but, but capacity levels need to be addressed that specific needs and special circumstances of particularly vulnerable developing countries need to be given full consideration and that we can't sit back and wait and that we have to um, be proactive, precautionary about addressing climate change. Um, the UN Environment Program's financial initiative has developed a set of principles for sustainable insurance and responsible investment, which um, incorporate ideas around building awareness and, and, um, and full participation. And, and finally, um, notions around prior informed consent um, around uh, in international around uh, international law around hazardous substances and and um, and the use of traditional knowledge in particular around um, genetic resource uh, manipulation, I, I think are also relevant to uh, local community participation and and, um, and and their ability to make decisions around around how um, their issues are addressed. Uh, that is is all for me today. Um, thanks again to Slycan Trust and to all of you for um, 
for listening to me over the last couple of days. Uh, I really am am, am happy to have participated uh, so so fundamentally in this in this series of workshops and um, wish you all well. Thank you, Ms. Regal, and uh, thank you very much for, like you said, for, for being a part of uh, this workshop series for the past few days. I think all of us have learned quite a bit from your presentations and uh, the experience sharing has been uh, nothing but fantastic. Uh, so thank you once again to all of the speakers whom we've had with us so far, and also to joining us from Facebook. Hello, and thank you for joining. Just uh, laying out a couple of reminders uh, that we've been putting out for the the past few days. Uh, we have a registration form on Google Forms that I've linked on chat. I would kindly request you to fill that up so we have an understanding of who's in the room. And, uh, you know, if you're connecting much later after this discussion, we could have a more uh, focused uh, group discussion with a smaller group, perhaps. So please do, I would encourage all of you all to kindly fill that form out. And if there's anyone on Zoom, uh, who would like to rename themselves to indicate their name and their country so that it better help facilitate uh, breakout rooms after the presentations, that would also be great. And finally, if anyone has any questions for the speakers here on Zoom or on Facebook, kindly do drop it on the chat and we'll be happy to take it forward to the speakers during the Q&A session. So uh, thank you very much once again, Ms. Siegel, for your presentation. And uh, now I would like to invite Ms. Vasudha Vijayanayaka, the Executive Director at Slyke and Shad, to make her presentation. What's with her? Hi, Sunny. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Would you hello, hello me? everyone. Uh, yes, I'll share from my end, yes. Looks good. Could you check? You can see it, okay. Yes. Um, just put it on. Now I'm going to. Is it on full screen or is it on? Uh, not, not, not just yet. Why isn't this working? Just give me a second. Maybe I should close this and then. Oh, if it's easy, you can do it as well. But uh, I'd rather do it from this. Side. Okay. As long as you can see it, it's is it it's not okay, working. Let is me it? do that. Uh, sorry, it's still on the slide which says entry points for engagement. And uh, wait, let me try to share it from my end. So uh... no, wait, 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 wait. Okay, sorry. Let, let me try again, and hopefully this time it works. <laughs> um... okay, can you see it now? Yes, we can see it. it's not a full screen yet, but it's on the first slide. Okay, I do not know why this is happening. Let me, let me I think it. try making it full screen before you share and then sharing the full screen image. Yeah, that sort of blocks the... Okay, uh, one second. Sorry about this. That actually, so it's maybe Seni, you should try from your end because if I put it full screen, I can't go back to yeah. the. All right, okay, just give me a second. Sorry. Okay. I can see it on the screen though. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, we can start from there. Yes, I'm sharing it. Oh, thank you, Dennis. So um, I'm skipping a few slides because um, Linda made a very comprehensive presentation. I do not think I need to go through the first and second slides of the presentation. Um, so what I've been speaking about is how um, a risk transfer mechanism, uh, specifically climate and disaster insurance, could be inclusive and participatory. Um, and I do not know whether everyone sees boxes in the middle of the slide. Does everyone see boxes in the middle of the slide? Or is it just me? There's just one on top, yes. 
Ah, okay, why is this happening? All right, okay, I'll just keep talking and I hope it everyone can see. The box should be gone now. Right, okay, thank you. So um, how do we work around an inclusive and participatory insurance um, system or mechanism to address climate and disaster risk? as a risk transfer mechanism. So how does inclusive come in? How does participatory come in? Um, so in many of the systems that we have today, uh, these products have been developed in advance and given to communities that have been um, vulnerable to disasters or climate change. So what we're looking at is a process where communities, uh, policymakers, private sector, the product developers, all of them could be working at all levels. Um, so inclusive could be in the sense of having specific vulnerabilities addressed, um, gender responsive and sensitive products being developed, um, then data collection being participatory, and also having different elements of social, economic, and um, environmental indicators that are included. And then um, participatory also interconnects with this very, um, very much. So inclusive part comes in participation where youth, women, uh, different actors such as the government, the private sector, um, technical experts come together to develop these products uh, that would be benefiting the communities and um, other parties that are vulnerable to climate change. So um, how does this help? Participation and inclusion increases the ownership of a product. It addresses the actual risks that are at the ground level because when you're collecting data, if you're talking to the communities, you know the actual risk that they are facing. Uh, and then also the awareness is being increased uh, in an actor's group that work together. Um, and also it builds trust. So some of the work that we do uh, as like and trust, we work on research and policy actions um, or interventions that we do, uh, which focus on risk management uh, related to climate change, as well as resilience building. So something we face is that there's a lack of trust among actors uh, working on climate and disaster risk insurance. And if the ownership is there from the start of the process, then the trust is actually built and we can have more um, productive efforts to address the climate risk that we are facing. Uh, next slide. Dennis. Uh, can someone shift the slide, please? It's on, uh, it's on a new slide which says entry points for engagement. Right, now it's visible, thank you. Um, so how can we use different entry points to ensure that uh, inclusion and participation um, and then engagement can be facilitated? Um, so one is development of products. Um, so for example, right now in Sri Lanka, we do have um, a crop insurance that's there. But if you're developing a new product or if you're trying to enhance these processes that are already there, we could look into engaging actors from different uh, stakeholder groups so that these could be more informed and then uh, updated based on the vulnerabilities that people uh, are facing and also the needs and gaps that are being shared by different actors um, and also uh, data availability that could be enhanced um, that kind of brings more risk assessments um, or more um, evidence-based risk assessments that are being taken into consideration in the product development um, for example um, the assessments and the vulnerabilities that we look into. Uh, so there are different processes that we, that we have in countries. Uh, for example, the national communications, the NDCs, the national adaptation plans, uh, which would require assessments um, at round level uh, of the risks that the, that the countries are facing. Um, so these could be brought together with the participation of communities um, and different other stakeholders so that what is out there as the risk assessment is actually what people and the communities and other actors are seeing as evidence-based actions that need to be taken. Then also the coordination um, and having multi-actor partnerships set up. Um, so this could be in setting up uh, different forums that are needed for implementation of different um, climate action. For example, if there's a project that is being a large scale project that focuses resilience, um, for, for example, agriculture sector maybe. Um, so in that instance, you could form a coordination mechanism that would contribute to uh, risk transfer mechanisms. Uh, similarly, if it's about NDCs or NAPs, uh, there are suggestions that would include the stakeholders to be involved and engaged in a manner that is sharing of information, knowledge, and technical expertise. So these could be taken as entry points to develop inclusive and participatory processes. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to highlight the enabling factors of 
policy and regulation that comes to play a role in the decision making part, as well as the inclusion and accountability and the participation which goes in to the insurance and um, participatory insurance mechanisms being developed. Um, so how can multi-actor partnerships uh, work? So uh, when you're looking at insurance, we look towards the public sector and the private sector primarily. Um, and then when we talk about insurance, sort of people do not have a lot of faith in Sri Lanka, at least as a, uh, as a practice in insurance schemes, uh, A, because a lot of people do not understand how insurance works not just climate and disaster insurance, but in general, because um, people see that as a savings that's being put in and something that they might not get back. And then they, they feel like this might not be useful for us. So uh, it's important that um, awareness is created. And in doing this, you can have a lot of actors working together. Uh, and then also the capacity building that could work um, to make sure that the ownership is increased, the partnerships are stronger and the effects of risk transfer mechanisms are more effective. Uh, so civil society organizations can work on this, um, um, bringing the evidence from the ground, uh, community-based organizations working with the communities on the ground to ensure the data is um, actually uh, what we would like to address, the risks that are actually on the ground. Um, and then also the private sector working with all the other actors so that the product that's developed is from the start ensured as something that could be owned by all parties not necessarily um, as a product for sale. So the benefits actually go to the communities uh, and, and address the risks and the vulnerabilities that need to be addressed. Um, and then there's also this opportunity to work among different um, groups to increase the capacity and the technical aspects related to climate and disaster risk transfer mechanisms, insurance, um, and then also um, incorporate these and integrating these into national processes and international processes to scale up the actions um, because resilience building connects strongly with the actions we take to minimize risk and uh, then also different um, knowledge products lessons learned could be scaled up and shared among different actors to see how they can contribute to the process um, so it's very important that we work together um, uh, and also how monitoring and evaluation can work also because this lack of um, faith in a system or the fact that you're not part of the system of uh, implementation uh, related to risk transfer actions uh, could be addressed if we have the impacts clearly stated so the data is accurate and then we assess the impacts in a manner that can be compared and understood by everyone so the defi definitions of what we're looking at the elements and the indicators that um, say these are the factors that make it a participatory and inclusive process would be important um, and that would help everyone to be included in all levels of the process, uh, formulation, implementation, and monitoring and evaluation. And then also see it in the sense of implementation plus policy and research related actions. Um, so yes, um, I have a bit of information that I would like to share on psych and trust work as well. If we quickly go to the next slide. So we have been doing work on uh, different aspects related to risk management and risk transfer, and specifically on um, climate and disaster risk insurance financing as well. Um, so we have our knowledge hub where you would find the publications. Um, and we also have a project that's ongoing uh, on climate and disaster risk financing. Uh, some of the um, outputs that we have uh, are regional outputs because we worked recently on a regional and comparative research related to NDCs on Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal, uh, where we are looking into what kind of gaps and needs exist for the implementation of NDCs. And, uh, and this relates to loss and damage as well. And then capacity gaps, engagement of stakeholders, um, outreach and awareness and data needs, research needs, these were highlighted by all countries and then um, and how we can address them through capacity building and technical expertise provision. And then we also have uh, some of the products, the case studies that we've been doing on uh, climate displacement, which has a component on um, risk as well, and then um, other policy briefs that relate to risk and also stakeholder engagement and inclusive uh, actions. So um, finally, I would also like to add that um, risk transfer doesn't work only under the unit C process, as Linda already highlighted. Um, so seeing how the national processes uh, and that connect to the international ones, and then the financial policies that relate to national development could all work in one um, like a, a collective process is very important otherwise we'd be duplicating things and would that would hinder scaling up actions 
um, and would have things in silos. So that's one thing that has always been a point that has been highlighted, the coordination and the non-duplication of actions. Um, so if you need more information, please refer to our research, uh, do write to us. We'll be happy to share more information on the work that we're doing. Uh, and then we also have uh, an upcoming research based on um, interviews and data collection uh, from farmers in Sri Lanka, which would be quite interesting as a case study also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vasita, for your presentation. And uh, thank you, Dennis, for stepping in to help us with some technical difficulties, uh, which always happens during these sessions, no matter how many times we do it. So uh, just to let everyone know once again uh, to please kindly fill out the registration form. The link is on the chat. I will drop it once again. And uh, also I have linked, uh, dropped a link to our Knowledge Hub, the knowledge portal that Fosita shared on uh, in a presentation earlier. We could look at all of our recent publications and blog posts and politicians and a lot of other stuff that we uh, regularly publish. Everything goes into our Knowledge Hub if you would want to have a look at some of the work that we do here at Slack and Trust. So for our next presentation, I would like to invite uh, Dr. S.P. R.K. Prabhakar. He's the research manager and senior policy researcher adaptation in our group at the Institute for Global Environment Strategy. Dr. Prabhakar. Yeah, um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, so I was asked to talk about the participatory and inclusive insurance and um, um, so what I plan to do is to connect the participation and inclusion towards the end of uh, insurance effectiveness. So uh, that's what I will be doing in my presentation. So the outline of the presentation is, first we will look at why we need a participatory and inclusive insurance. And um, thereafter I'll be presenting some examples uh, that are currently ongoing, uh, to what extent we are able to pa um, allow participation and inclusiveness and then uh, derive some conclusions based on that. So if you look at uh, the Asia's context, uh, nearly 60 to 50% uh, of the total population is dependent on whether sensitive sectors such as agriculture. And uh, uh, if you look at the 2002 drought in case of India, uh, one event has reduced the total agriculture production by 32 million tons in one year. But for, for the country uh, to recover the loss, it took nearly six years. So uh, the impact of the drought is not just on the production of the individual farmers in that particular year, but it also affected the uh, ability of the farmers to produce um, in the next six years. That is largely because of their inability to access um, seeds, fertilizers, and various other inputs uh, because of the financial loss that they faced in 2002. And this particular impact uh, uh, doesn't stop with farmers alone. Um, it tends to ripple um, at the macroeconomic scale. For example, in 2010 drought, uh, the non-performing assets um, of uh, public sector loans in India nearly doubled. And in 2008, if you look at the total uh, loan waivers, it stood there for 14.4 billion US dollars. And in comparison, the government of India has spent only 163 million US dollars on insurance. So this shows the imbalance in, in the uh, kind of priority that uh, governments give to uh, short-term reactive policies against uh, long-term mitigation and risk spreading instruments. So this experience of 2008-2002 droughts, they indicate to us that the access to finance is very important for uh, rural communities soon after a disaster. And uh, if, if they could get any access to finance immediately after the disaster, their ability to bounce back to normal um, conditions uh, improves uh, substantially. Um, so risk insurance has been promoted with the premise that um, that kind of financial fluctuations in uh, livelihoods can be uh, mitigated uh, sub substantially. That is a primary premise of the insurance. And secondarily, um, it also um, enables uh, understand the risk taking behavior of the individuals um, and many other you know, um, uh, theoretical um, advantages have been uh, reported or um, to some extent uh, uh, studied on the ground, uh, but uh, many of these advantages have not been realized in reality in a, in a single product or single insurance product. And for uh, that is because of uh, various reasons. For example, uh, if you look at the agriculture uh, residual risk in Asia is uh, very substantial. That means that 
we are putting a high expectations on insurance uh, to um, address these residual risks, uh, whereas the ability to pay for insurance premiums uh, among the potential subscribers is very poor. Um, uh, that's one of the major problems. And other problems include uh, ad adverse selection and moral hazard, uh, limited data, um, and um, high operation uh, insurance costs, um, delayed and undervalued indemnity payments, and lack of trust on the insurance providers. All these factors, they contribute to um, you know, lack of realizing the real potential of the insurance in Asia. And when we talk about the participatory and inclusive insurance, we expect that these participatory and inclusive approaches have to address uh, some or many of these uh, limitations that the insurance is facing currently in Asia. So what do we mean by um, participatory and inclusive insurance? Um, some of the character characteristics were already um, described by Ms. Vosita in her presentation. Uh, but uh, in nutshell, uh, we um, aim to engage our ultimate stakeholders, ultimate um, um, you know, subscribers or potential subscribers in not only understanding their risks, but also in developing and implementing the insurance products on the ground. So that is the um, ultimate aim of the participatory and inclusive. And secondly, we also want to look at no one left behind objective of the insurance products. Uh, for example, uh, Ms. Vosita also talked about highly vulnerable people or women and old aged people and um, uh, uh, groups like that. Uh, but also it's about um, uh, empowering the uh, I mean, ensuring the principles of empowerment and non-discrimination while designing and implementing the insurance products. So how does this particular objectives compare with the business as usual insurance products that are available today? Um, if you look at the business as usual products, usually the insurance products are developed uh, by looking at the data. So um, uh, may not be directly uh, studying the farmer or the subscriber base. Uh, of course, the situation is improving, but most of the cases, um, many of these stakeholders end up as being a data point and there is no uh, direct or deeper understanding of their uh, risk characteristics. Uh, so um, that leads to development of uh, insurance products that tend to be very blanket in nature, not targeting the uh, or tailored to the location specific or uh, sector or even the uh, uh, social group specific insurance products. Uh, because of this um, lack of engagement between insurance companies and um, uh, insurance uh, subscriber base, there is a lack of trust uh, leading to limited buy-in by the you know, communities, um, often uh, high operational and premium costs leading to limited sustainability. But if you superimpose the participatory scenario over this situation, um, the participatory and inclusive approaches tend to uh, help, uh, you know, trust building and um, understand the you know risk characteristics of the uh, specific uh, communities that leads to development of insurance products that are highly localized and specialized in nature um, tend to address moral hazard and adverse selection issues as well um, but when it comes to the cost of the insurance uh, there is a, a balancing act that is happening here for example if you are talking about reaching maximum subscriber base, uh, that is uh, actually uh, kind of uh, reaching economies of scale, and you expect that insurance cost will go down. However, uh, once you talk about localized and specialized insurance products, probably your economies of scale is not achieved. That means in those conditions, probably your insurance cost will be uh, much higher or not affordable, but this particular um, negative effect of the participatory and uh, inclusive insurance can be, um, you know, addressed by, you know, engaging the subscriber base in data collection and uh, other activities that is happening because of the um, uh, evolution or, you know, kind of innovations happening in the information technology and um, communication channels. Um, so because of this, we are seeing a lot of innovation in product design because of the our ability to uh, participate or allow participation from the subscriber base. Um, so um, I will not go into detail in this particular diagram, but you will see that uh, uh, while, uh, by enhancing the participation of the subscriber base, uh, we can uh, enhance a lot of benefits that are given here. For example, risk awareness is increased, 
um, farm profitability is increased and things like that. But also you will also be addressing on the cost side of the insurance as well, leading to substantial reduction on the burden of, on the individuals, but also on the um, uh, national exchequer as well. So um, from here onwards, I will talk about some examples. For example, in Philippines, when uh, production cost insurance was implemented in a group setup and the farmers were allowed to visit each other's farms and uh, um, allow each other to educate about the farming practices, a substantial reduction in the crop loss and the reduction in the crop inputs have, have, were reported. And um, it has led to uh, really a reduction in the indemnity payments, as well as a uh, reduction in the cost of production as well. So uh, this is a one um, a small example of the potential of the participatory insurance uh, that can uh, bring to the overall uh, scenario. Uh, in terms of the insurance costs, um, uh, the go-to um, you know, tool for the governments is to subsidize on the premium. Uh, it's very good approach if you have unlimited amount of resources and um, uh, if you don't want to worry about the real cost of the risk, but uh, that's not the case in many of the developing countries. And uh, unfortunately, because of this heavy subsidy on the premium, the uh, we are not really educating farmers on the real cost of the risk that they are facing. So this uh, particular uh, limitation can be uh, overcome by uh, participatory and uh, inclusive insurance. For example, uh, the new um, products that are based on picture-based crop insurance uh, being implemented in, in many parts of India and Africa. Um, the examples, they indicate that uh, there is a drastic reduction in the overhead costs, data collection costs, and also um, efficiency and accuracy in the damage assessment. And the immediate um, uh, payment of the indemnity uh, a lot of benefits um, that are happening just by engaging the farmers in data collection itself. And in case of um, uh, Karnataka in India, um, the crop cutting experiments, many of you know, they are the, the primary source of information to collect the uh, damage uh, data from the crop. And uh, by engaging the um, farmers using dedicated apps, the farmers are able to collect a precise, uh, high accurate and frequent uh, data collection, uh, leading to a quick payment of the indemnities as well as the uh, highest precise risk assessment. Similarly, in Gujarat, in India, um, the digitization and many other stages of the livestock insurance has been uh, uh, put in subscribers that has uh, been reported to have a um, very good impact on the um, you know cost of the insurance as well as uh, um, uh, reach of the insurance as well. Um, as I said earlier, um, the participatory and inclusive insurance will allow us to um, kind of uh, innovate uh, substantially uh, compared to the business as usual insurance. For example, um, there are examples where uh, the group savings linked insurance uh, schemes are implemented, uh, where farmers, uh, they deposit money uh, towards their uh, you know, savings accounts, but the interest earned on those deposits can be uh, accounted for a part of their uh, risk component of the insurance or a, a complete uh, risk component of the insurance. So because of this, the willingness to uh, engage in the insurance has increased uh, because of the reduced burden and the farmers don't feel that you know their money is completely lost in the event of you know no disaster years uh, which is uh, um, problematic in in uh, areas where the disaster frequency is very low uh, but still you know uh, you need uh, to have insurance to take care of the extreme events uh, similarly, uh, we are seeing examples slowly coming up, uh, as in the case of the combination of the insurance with the payments of ecosystem services in a uh, in a community level or or a uh, watershed level in the upstream and downstream level. Uh, similarly, combining the insurance with the social security programs, all these forms of insurance products they tend to um, engage and enhance the participation and inclusiveness of the communities. Uh, one example that we can uh, um, ignore is uh, example coming from the Africa, Harita insurance being implemented by WFP, wherein uh, bundling of different approaches um, has enabled uh, re reduction of the cost of the insurance, reduction of the uh, risk itself, um, as well as enhancing savings of the um, you know, subscribers, uh, leading to the overall uh, I know spread of the insurance as well. Um, so all these examples, they indicate us that 
um, affordability, uh, people's technologies, and trust and willingness to engage are the prerequisites or enabling factors for participation and inclusiveness. Um, but these examples are very much location specific and uh, kind of a small scale examples. But when it comes to the larger policy implementations, larger um, policy programs like uh, as that of the government of India's prime minister, uh, Fasal Bhima Yojana, uh, which is um, applied at across the board, uh, implementation of um, uh, you know um, high technologies, for example, satellite data and artificial intelligence is contributing to a reduction of the cost of insurance and quick payment of the premiums, uh, I mean, indemnities, uh, things like that. However, the participation um, is uh, not very much addressed. So what I propose is um, by in infusing the people's technologies in such a big programs, probably we can uh, further enhance the participation and inclusiveness as well. Uh, while we work on the in, uh, insurance uh, uh, or fine tuning the insurance, uh, we also need to remember that we need to work on the participation and its potential in the risk mitigation part of it as well. For example, uh, we know community based disasters management or community based adaptation planning. So we also need to make sure that uh, we link insurance uh, um, uh, you know, products or design of such products with the, this kind of mitigation um, uh, aspects as well. So thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prabhakar. And I think that was very interesting, uh, especially for for the few of us, I mean, all, all the others on the call who, who work on uh, insurance, particularly we are program data to climate insurance, uh, crop insurance. I think well, the aspects that you brought in on innovation was uh, definitely very interesting to everyone on the team. So thank you very much for your input. And uh, before we move on to our, our final speaker, I would like to remind everyone once again to kindly fill out the registration form that we provided on the chat. Uh, it would be good to get an understanding of who's on the call and uh, you know what organizations you come from. So if in case we want to take this discussion further, we could perhaps have a more closed group discussion as well. So um, yeah, so thank you very much, Dr. Prabhakar. And uh, finally, I will like to um, welcome Dr. Jennifer Sisse. She's, she's, she's a senior research manager, climate risk finance and resilience at Munich Climate Insurance Initiative. Uh, MCII is also a part of uh, uh, is also part of a uh, uh, consortium as part of our multi actor partnership on climate and disastrous finance and its resilience, which is uh, the, the same project under which this virtual week is also being take place. Uh, it's also taking place. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Jen, for taking part, and thank you, I think Victoria joined us earlier this week. So yeah. So without further ado, over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Um... I know we're a bit behind, so I'll try to be quick. Um, yeah, my name is Jen Cisse. I'm a senior risk manager at the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative, uh, senior research manager. Um, MCII, is, MCII is hosted by the UN University Institute for Environment and Human Security, and um, is really a think tank on climate change and insurance issues. Um, including developing solutions for um, the risks posed by climate change for low income and climate vulnerable people on the global south. So I'm really happy to be here with you today. Let's see if I can. There we go. I don't know. Ugh. Hopefully the video panel at the top will disappear in a second. Um, so I wanted to start by um, briefly touching on some work that MCII did with the Insure Resilience Global Partnership. Um, several years ago, this was work on what are called the pro poor principles. And although I think the previous two speakers did a great job of um, highlighting what inclusion and participation mean for um, disaster risk finance, I thought I'd share um, these principles because they were developed through a participatory and inclusive process. Um, and they were created to help um, incorporate a people-centered approach to CDRFI solutions. So as you'll see, these um, pro poor principles of the Insure Resilience Global Partnership provide a, a frame of reference for aligning partners and designing and implementing um, people-centered risk financing solutions. So the five principles are impact, quality, ownership, 
complementarity, and equity. So each of these uh, five principles actually has a whole range of sub principles and on the previous slide I shared a link um, to those principles so you can take a look for yourselves, but I did want to highlight a few of the sub principles which include focuses on promoting endogenous or local approaches and supporting demand driven solutions. Um, integrating gender frameworks and being inclusive and gender responsive managing basis risk for parametric or index based products and monitoring evaluating and learning from activities and results um, following evidence based decision making. So these are some of the things that are hit on um, across many of the different principles. Particularly, um, I wanted to talk about the focus on evidence and knowledge and learning of lessons. So uh, in the last year, I've spent a lot of my time at MCA, I focused on something that we're calling the evidence roadmap. This is because there has been, I think, a lot of innovation and the previous speaker really highlighted a lot of the different um, pilots and activities that are going on in the world around CDRFI. However, a lot of these new solutions have not been accompanied by adequate learning and evidence and documentation. So the evidence roadmap is really um, an initiative to take the current knowledge that we have, but maybe haven't shared widely enough within our community, as well as an understanding of work that is being currently done to identify the gaps and the needs for evidence and learning and knowledge moving forward so that we can direct evidence investments and activities by donors and researchers um, and others working in this space. So the plan is to ensure that CDRFI um, efficiently and effectively supports vulnerable and exposed people, communities and countries by building on knowledge of what works and what doesn't work and um, how we can most effectively meet people's needs. So the evidence roadmap um, started with a kickoff workshop in the fall last year and we have a workshop web page which is still available where all of the videos of our different sessions um, can be found and there's a link to that here. Um, but we started by actually asking experts to help us write five different evidence briefs. Those evidence briefs covered microinsurance, mesoinsurance and aggregation, sovereign risk pools, macro policy solutions, which was actually um, co-written by our partners at Slack and Trust, and non-insurance DRF. So these evidence briefs um, were written by experts who knew the current knowledge and evidence in the field and captured that so that we could understand what, what do we know, what experiences have we had of, as an international community, and therefore to identify the gaps and needs for evidence moving forward. So this is one thing that um, I, um, I have been spending a lot of time on at MCII, but I also wanted to briefly highlight a couple of the other projects that um, I'm involved in. One is um, the Craig mm -hmm. Climate Risk Adaptation and Insurance in the Caribbean Project. Um, this project has been ongoing since 2011, um, and actually, I think Linda in her slides, um, one of them mentioned the Livelihood Protection Policy, or the LPP, which is a parametric extreme wind rainfall product that MCII and CRIF and our partners um, were developed and were selling in the Caribbean. Um, and so since this project has been ongoing for quite some time, actually, MCII has learned a lot of lessons about what what works and what doesn't work so well and, and where um, organizations need to focus their efforts. So we published this um, 20 Lessons Learned document uh, late last year, and that's available at this link um, and on our website. Themes for these lessons learned include managing expectations, um, issues around product design, market development, and engagement for sustainability. So MCII really built on these lessons with our um, new project in the Pacific. Um, MCII is implementing PCAP with the UNDP and UNCDF in the Pacific starting in Fiji and Vanuatu. And this is a new project, it just was launched in December. 
Um, so our work is revolves around four work streams. One is enabling policy and regulations to open digital payments and ecosystem, open digital payment ecosystems. Um, three, inclusive innovation, and four, consumer empowerment. So as I mentioned, these work streams are really building on um, the lessons we learned from the Caribbean and from um, others working in this space to make sure that policies are designed to meet the needs of people that are. Uh, distribution and payout channels are effective um, and that consumers have the information they need to be able to um, integrate disaster risk finance into their disaster risk management planning. Um, so specifically, um, in order to make sure that this work is inclusive, we are engaging right now in a lot of different things, um, such as demand and supply assessments, risk assessments, um, consultations with the government and other stakeholders, including potential clients. And we're really hoping to look at hybrid and bundled insurance solutions, hybrid solutions being solutions that pair parametric insurance as with indemnity insurance so that you can get the quick payouts from a parametric product, but also have the security of an indemnity insurance product um, and bundled solutions um, that pair, for example, um, insurance with savings, as was discussed by the previous speaker, or with agricultural inputs. There are a lot of different um, options to consider that may meet the needs of clients better or, or less well, um, as well as non-insurance financial solutions. So that's all I had. I'm really happy to speak about any of these in more detail or to discuss um, our work on the MAPS project with Slack and Trust and other partners. So thank you for the opportunity. Thanks very much, Jen, and uh, thank you very much once again to all of our speakers. We will be uh, changing up the agenda just a bit to make it more interactive, I think, because the input that we received so far has been fantastic. Um, so I'm just going to come back with my registration form announcement. The uh, link to the Google form is on the chat. Kindly do uh, fill that in so that we have an understanding of who's in the room. Also, maybe just to get the <laughs> Sorry, just to get the interactive session started, I am opening up a Mentimeter. Uh, the code to the Menti is on the chat as well. Uh, so you should be able to log on to menti.com and use the code 470582. I'm not to share my screen, so I could have a look at it. And uh, yeah, just uh, type in to uh, let us know where you're coming from. Because I'm not sure how many would go through the chat to uh, check the countries. So you have a part of France, uh, Sri Lanka, we are from Sri Lanka, Japan, Trinidad and Tobago, that, that's four, that's the three continents. <laughs> uh, Germany, I, I did see some participants from the African continent as well. Uh, we have a participant from the UK. Mm, is there anyone else? So if you're wondering what's happening on the screen, just uh, log on to menti.com and use the code uh, 470582. There's another participant from Bangladesh uh, here in South Asia. And uh, all right, uh, so thank you very much for taking part. And there's just one more question to um, from Sierra Leone. Right, so one more question to uh, understand uh, the type of organization that you're joining us from. So whether you're a CSO, government organization, private organization, academia, or other. So if you're joining us from Facebook, um, do uh, also maybe take part in the mentee. You could log on to menti.com and use the code 470582. Okay, so we have, okay, what, what looks like almost an equal number of participants distributed, or maybe not, <laughs> across the spectrum. Okay, uh, so thank you very much to everyone who uh, took part in our little uh, men. Okay, we, yes, on the chat, we have a participant from Chad, Africa. Thank you, and thank you once again to everyone who joined. Uh, so, like I said, we are going to change up the agenda very slightly. So, before I uh, would like, before I, before Dennis comes on to maybe explain what to happen. I would also like to maybe invite everyone to type in any questions that you may have for all of the speakers 
on uh, you know anything that's presented or any discussions that you would want to bring to the table so just type them in on the chat or maybe raise your hand and then you could unmute you and the questions can also be uh, asked vocally so until you type in the questions i think dennis will be explaining on uh, what will be happening next dennis Yes, thank you very much, Sunny. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Dennis Mombauer. I'm Director of Research and Education at Slack and Trust. And um, as Sunny, as Sinasha said, uh, we are going to have a Q&A now first. But uh, I wanted to open the Miro board that we have set up, which is basically a virtual blackboard um, where you can put sticky notes on, which uh, will hopefully capture some of the discussions that we're having and some input. So I'll quickly show how this works. So you can already start putting uh, notes there during the Q&A before we open up for an open discussion anyway. Uh, I'll share my screen one second. This is how it looks. I hope you can all see it. Um, we have three questions uh, that are there. What actions can be taken to strengthen the relationship between farmers, insurers, and other key stakeholders? We have farmers here because uh, our focus in Sri Lanka is uh, the agriculture sector, but uh, other Basically, everyone who is getting some kind of climate or disaster insurance uh, could be put in for that. That's also covered with other key stakeholders. Second question, how can insurance systems handle climate change, COVID-19, and other risks? And what are the limits of insurance schemes? And the third question would be, how can gender, dynam how can gender dynamics and vulnerabilities be addressed when it comes to insurance? And how can insurance be made participatory and inclusive? So if you have any input uh, on these from your area of work, from your experiences, any best practices, uh, or even any uh, questions or ideas, uh, you can go here on the left side, create a sticky note, place it anywhere. This one seems very small now. Okay. All right, I think I have changed some setting. Maybe someone from our team can quickly create a sticky note to show how it looks. Okay, very interesting. All right, we'll try to fix this uh, because I think they're all very small now, the sticky note that we're creating. We have to zoom in quite a lot. Usually they are uh, a bit bigger than that. I will try to fix it, but basically you click on this, create a sticky note, put it somewhere, and then you can write in it anything, any input you would want to provide. Okay, I will check this technical issue. And in the meantime, we can go to the Q&A. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Dennis. And um, also maybe if we could link the micro board uh, on the chat, I think while the Q&A is going on, hopefully without uh, participants being too distracted, uh, Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, Dennis is already uh, linked it on the chat. So, if there are parts of been too distracted, you could maybe multitask a bit here. So, um, so just to open up QA, and I would like to, oh, oh sorry, before the QA, and I think it's time to take a picture. Um, and since it's our last workshop uh, for of four, I would, it would be great if everyone could turn on their uh, videos and you could take a big uh, smiling picture. Right, so we are just going to try and get as many people as we can because uh, I think this workshop is worth celebration. So um, just think. Um, I think some of our colleagues from Flight and Trust could also maybe turn on their cameras as well. Right. So just so I guess. Everyone keep smiling and we'll take a few screenshots. And also don't forget there's a page two if you're taking screenshots. All right, thank you very much. and. Uh, 
for the for the q and a um do we already have some questions on the chat uh, which we could take and i would maybe request all of the panelists to keep their uh, videos on if your connection is good enough so we could make this uh, as interactive as possible so um there's a question from varuni as in the chat to lucas uh, when combining parametric and traditional insurance mechanisms, what are the challenges faced by countries, especially developing countries with poor access to advanced so advanced uh, with poor access to advanced sophisticated technology? What are the areas that require attention in order to overcome such challenges? Yeah, I hope my uh, video is uh, this time good enough. Uh, the connection, so you can also see me. Um, I think it's very similar to the issues that we face on a regular level with uh, companies and that is uh, basically data budget and uh, understanding. Um, data is obviously always a bit of a, a tricky thing where uh, we uh, always face a bit of a black box, I would say, as uh, the risk modeling is quite AI driven, for example, and uh, uh, getting here the transparency both to companies and um, uh, governments is quite key, explaining them and uh, allowing them to, to trust in the data. Um, what is usually quite a good approach for that is to have certification agents and independent third agents involved into such a process. Um, for example, when we think about pilots, it's also very useful to have NGOs and similar entities involved. Uh, where you really uh, have an independent actor and a sort of honest broker um, in the in the midst of it, um, which uh, uh, can explain and also uh, in some way guarantee that there is not some uh, basic uh, some bias towards the insurer or and uh, a non payout in that fact, and of course also to ensure for the insurer uh, that um, basically he can trust in the data and that he can work with this data because uh, the data has to be, of course, very independent. Um, what we, for example, cannot usually use is uh, data provided by clients directly, which, uh, you should, which um, puts us in a very difficult position sometimes, um, but it's a necessary step to have really here uh, the, the setup for, for parametric insurance and something that is independent of the uh, specific insured party. Um, then budget, of course, is a, a big issue for companies, especially now in the hardening market. Um, when you tell them that they have to spend some more money on insurance, it's always a bit of an issue. And I, I don't think it's any different with uh, governments in that instance as well. Um, here, I think it's it's really the, the core um, prospect or, or the core aim that you uh, manage to address the risks that uh, put a dent into the, the governmental budget, which present really an issue. So for example, if it's crop, if it's hurricane or something similar that you can really focus these risks and then work on them in a very tailored manner for this respective government or, or company and not sort of try to diversify it uh, too much with different perils because that usually, at least with parametric insurance only unnecessarily increases the price um, whereas, of course, with traditional insurance, they can then take these uh, risks that uh, may not be such a big issue um, that are happening very infrequently, for example, or who have a very low uh, uh, damages. Um, that's something that traditional insurance can cover very well then, whereas parametric might be uh, suited for something else. And then the understanding, of course, is very uh, key. I would say parametric insurance can be uh, quite complex in some manner. And uh, here is a lot of explaining um, needed. Here is a lot of uh, interaction needed, of course, with, with different uh, players and on different levels. And uh, that is a, a key part of, of any company and uh, any government, I think, in taking up uh, parametric insurance, but also combining it with uh, traditional insurance, because um, of course the, the goal itself is quite nice to combine parametric and traditional, but to really get a benefit out of it, uh, they have to understand uh, both products and they have to understand how they can have a, a financial advantage uh, getting out of it. 
and uh, to get better uh, risk coverage at the end of the day. So that's a bit in the a short frame. I think I think there are a couple of other issues um, also in development countries that uh, could be addressed. But from our experience, I think it's really data budget and then uh, understanding, which is really key in that aspect. Thanks very much, Dorfit. Um We have a question for Vasita um, and uh, Varunia. You spoke of bringing different actors when developing a new product or when updating a product to ensure risk transfer mechanisms um, are more effective and inclusive. Despite such discussions, there are gaps in getting the community involved and ensuring gender inclusiveness in these processes. What are the practical ways to address such gaps? Right. Um, thank you, Sani. Um, I, I think gender in itself is something that needs to be built capacity on because uh, we talk about it and then go into the ground level and then trying to implement. Uh, this becomes a, a more complicated aspect than talking about the topic. So um, one is like there is an assumption that, that it's not gender responsive, the action while talking about it at times, which might be not the case when we go to the ground level as well, because sometimes the community has, um, so this is an example of how uh, there's an assumption that gender responsive actions are not there, but it could be that it's not formalized, but it exists in the system in a manner that's a practical and conservative way of doing things. Um, so having an understanding of what really works where is important, and also finding potentially not formalized systems, but informal ways of engaging women and um, having a gender balanced approach or even transformative and responsive actions that can be implemented would be important. Um, so working in Sri Lanka in some of the work that we realized is when we take the farmer lists or the documentation on data related to agriculture, the land is usually attached to a male. So then there is this assumption that women are not involved in agriculture, but then on the ground, they're actually very much involved. So that's, that's something that has been studied, um, how land issues and rights link with the inclusive and participatory insurance is something that has been uh, questioned or brought into uh, some discussions already. Um, so, and also the recording systems, because when people go into a discussion, they assume the lead of the family is male, but then when we dig a bit deeper in how the household runs, um, some of the key decisions, long-term decisions are made by women or in uh, in discussion between the two parties. So, um, so there's a bit more that we need to look into when we are taking actions and going deep and finding this information because in public forums, even in communities, sometimes the information wouldn't come out. So it has to be um, in a way that we talk um, with people who are from the community, who work with them and see what works best uh, to ensure that gender responsiveness and inclusion of women and uh, girls are part of the process. But I feel like um, rather than me talking more about this, there might be case studies from other partners who would have experiences to share. So I'd like to request them to talk. Thanks, Rosita. Um, I would also maybe like to pass this very question to the other panelists who would like to respond. Um, I can just chime in from MCAI's perspective. I totally agree that this is a, a challenge and it's something that we're striving to get better at. Um, we do know that often um, risk transfer products are viewed as gender blind in a way, but that doesn't mean that the impacts of natural hazards or the impacts of finance are, are gender blind. So we are trying to make sure that we now in our newer products and adding to our older products, make sure that we are asking potential clients about their dif the different impacts of um, extreme weather events on girls, boys, men and women in their communities having an increased understanding of the livelihood differences. Um, and also, I think a, a key thing that we're hoping to do more going forward is engaging local CSOs that explicitly work on gender and gender mainstreaming to make sure that we are asking the right questions in the right way to the right people, um, which can often be a challenge for um, people who are trying to design products from Europe <laughs> to meet the needs of, of local communities. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Jen. Um, 
would any of the other panelists like to uh, take this question or uh, Dr. Prabhakar, I'm wondering, would you want to add to this? Yeah, um, not so much as a answer to the question, but uh, I was wondering if uh, there are any insurance products or even the contracts designed in such a way that the indemnity payments are made to the female members of the household. Because, you know, usually what happens is um, we were doing some surveys in parts of India and um, um, we were told that, you know, her hus husband never told that he received an insurance payout. And uh, uh, because of that, you know, they couldn't use the money especially meant for agriculture purpose. So this is a common uh, complaint where women is not engaged in the in the household decisions. Um, so one of the discussions were uh, in the in the workshop we organized that is it possible to you know kind of design the contact such a way that the payments are made to the female household members. Um, that could be one way to ensure that the responsible member of the household receives the payout. But you know. Um, that's a pretty much local issue. It doesn't necessarily need to be a uh, big uh, decision by corporations or even governments, I think. It's just a part of the small contractual uh, design element, I think. Thanks very much, Dr. Prabhakar. And um, just while uh, the questions are coming in, want to remind everybody that the Myra board is also buzzing with activity. I will just drop the link once again that Dennis had shared. So, I mean, please do also contribute to the board so maybe we could take it forward in the discussion. Uh, so, moving on with the question. Um, if yes. Sunny, if you don't mind, um, I, I think uh, what Dr. Prabhakar raised um, as an example is um, something important because I think I've heard this being discussed in different forums um, as to how um, providing the compensation to women could ensure that the money or the finance is used in a way that would be long term and not in one go and there might be some sustainable aspects related to it um, while I mean I'm, I'm just being devil's advocate um, here just just putting it out so when we're doing this um, I'm wondering whether we, we need to take into consideration how that would impact the uh, household uh, relationships as well because if we enter into a contract with communities uh, the women to have the compensation received how the male or the husband could feel about this um, and with, whether that's going to actually create an additional issue. So there would need to be this awareness, the discussion where everyone, I, I'm, I'm all for gender <laughs> responsive actions. I'm actually an advocate for it. Just thinking about how this would impact if uh, we go to a community and say, we are going to give the compensation to women only and then um, whether that will actually lead to other issues uh, at the household level. So I think when we're deciding everything, uh, social aspects uh, would need to be considered and awareness and why this is happening and how the money transfers happen, all that will need to be brought into uh, the action. And I think Jen wants to add something. Yeah, no, I was going to hit on that last point exactly. Um, I think one other thing that we are recognizing is that um, there's been a big push to use digital platforms, ICT technologies, in order to make payouts because the goal is to, to be more inclusive, to increase access to finance. However, often we do not see equal access between men and women to those types of technologies. So that's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about your, your distribution and, and payout mechanisms. Um, the other thing I would add is that because I'm the evidence person, there's a lot of evidence that actually men are not likely to use cash transfers for vice goods. They actually um, usually do invest in the livelihoods of their families. Um, and I'm sure this is context specific, but often the issue is that men's priorities may be in terms of production, whereas women's priorities may be in terms of other household needs. And I think one, you know, you asked about, you know, situations where spouses may not even know that a payout was made. And that is something that I think is on those making the payout to make sure that information is widely available enough that one member of the household couldn't hide it from another. Um, thanks very much. Uh, would anyone else, maybe Ms. Beagle, would you like to add to that as well? Uh, 
Um, thank you, thank you, Sinasha, and, and this is a fascinating conversation. I'm I'm really an international law specialist, so some of the specifics around around the, the evidence, which I find fascinating, um, it is 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 really not within my remit. But um, I'm happy to continue participating in the conversation. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. So um, I think we there are a few more questions that uh, maybe we could also take. Um, right. So sorry, where did we stop? Uh, so we forgot the gap. And yeah, so so there is a question to Lucas from uh, Vosita. Uh, what about when uh, the client is in the country and the data is and the data that is available? It's a government-based data system, I think. Sorry, just to put it in context, I was referring to where the data was not supposed to be taken from the client. Um, and I just want to check if the insurance system is for a country and the data available for the national level would be also a country, how does that work? That's, that's all good. I mean, if it's a separate uh, institution or, or research organization, something like that, you know, where uh, you know that they are independent of uh, some political decision making, um, then it's all good. Um, in general, I think any way that um, Chica, for example, or, or other organizations have a very, very good, um, provide very, very good uh, data as well. So um, I in the Asian context, so it's uh, it's all it's it's all fine. I think uh, one just has to be careful to not uh, fall into into any traps here. But I don't see any limitation here, really. Um, thanks very much. Um, sorry, there's a, a question from, uh, for example, so we asked Dr. Prabhakar. Uh, so there's a question from Dennis, actually, uh, to any of the presenters. In yesterday's discussion, Linda brought up the point that insurance doesn't necessarily have to be paid with money, but instead workable out production capacity, etc. Do you have any ex experiences with this or examples of such schemes? Um, I'm opening the floor to any panelists who would like to take this. Okay, so maybe um, I'd like to put Dr. Prabhakar on the spot first. Okay, uh, I think I already responded to the question there. Uh, if you look at the Harita example from um, Africa, that's what they are doing. Basically, they are targeting uh, working and um, uh, poor communities who can't uh, insure. Um, so what they are doing is instead of asking for cash payments, they are asking to work for certain, you know, infrastructure development project for one week in a month, or, you know, uh, they can decide, you know, uh, how many number of days and hours they can work on the project and that will contribute towards the uh, premium payment. Um, it has been, it has received a very good reviews, actually, the Haritha project. Uh, I would suggest uh, anybody interested in um, bundling approaches uh, to read, uh, it's a very good uh, example. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Prabhakar. Jen? No, I was just going to mention that uh, he had covered that example um, in the, his presentation. Um, I, I would also just point out that um, most successful agricultural insurance schemes in the West um, are actually highly subsidized. <laughs> and that in addition to having people um, provide time or labor, um, to pay premiums, I think often successful agricultural insurance products um, have a high level of government support. Right. Uh, thank you very much. I, I also have a question, I think, um, to maybe any, any of the panelists, I think. So this was from a couple of presentations that, that took place. So I think when we looked at stakeholder engagement, especially at community level, there was uh, this element of uh, trust that and like relationship or rapport building with uh, with authoritative bodies that was brought into discussion. But I also want to just get some perspective from any of the panelists on when we look at this aspect of things and as CSOs trying to build engagement with communities for the first time, especially if there's a strained relationship with any sort of 
uh, bodies that you know issue these payouts. So, um, what 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 is the role as CSOs there? And like, what do we bring to the table in order for say communities such as that to trust us and to help us, you know, continue the work there or to build engagement there? It's it's open to any panelist. Celsius, madam, uh, I am yes. sp speaking from Bangladesh. I am yes. Mr. Habibur Rahman. Uh, yes. We have uh, different uh, question uh, to you uh, that uh, I want to know that uh, promoting uh, rainwater, uh, rainwater utilization for sustainable drinking water supply to venerable people in our Bangladesh, but uh, you know. Uh, our uh, country is uh, money uh, surrounded uh, in a river and uh, the river uh, is the uh, very flood um, uh, cyclone uh, we are uh, very uh, uh, destroy our uh, crops and uh, hardcore uh, people are uh, very miserable condition uh, so uh, we uh, we want uh, their fresh <coughs> fresh water supply uh, by rainwater harvesting um, uh, surface water uh, system. Uh, please uh, do you discuss uh, about uh, this matter. Thank you. Um, sorry, sorry, Dr. Raman, just to just to um, just to get an understanding of what exactly your question is. So, so you did speak of uh, the access to uh, I think water and like the rainwater harvesting systems, but uh, maybe if you could perhaps uh, clearly state what your question is, because I felt like there are a lot of components in that. Uh, we uh, are um, uh, uh, the system was um, uh, in the in the our uh, country, uh, the system is uh, very. Um... Okay, so uh, maybe I think uh, what we can do is perhaps add uh, some examples from South Asia on. Uh, sorry, is perhaps maybe add some examples from South Asia on uh, what. Uh... Sorry. Uh... Okay, um, Sydney, I think we have a lot of people's mics on for some yes, reason. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to mute uh, the, the noise. I just am not very sure where it is coming from. Um, okay, I think everyone's back on mute. Right, so um, maybe I think what we can uh, supplement it with is maybe some of uh, the work that we do here, at least in Sri Lanka. Maybe we could probably give an example of it, and I'm wondering if that would be of help. Maybe someone, yeah. Um, I think let's just merge the concept. I'm sorry, uh, okay. just to move forward. I think um, I, we can merge the concept of different hazards and disasters and lack of resources that connect with increasing risks, right? Um, so rainwater harvesting could be actually um, a solution to minimize the uh, climate impacts because if it's implemented as an adaptation measure, uh, effectively that could build resilience of communities and increase the economic capacity, which increases the adaptive capacity. Uh, so in a theoretical term of how risk transfer could happen, um, this could be a way to kind of reduce the risk of the community by implementing different options that facilitate um, uh, resources being allocated or provided to reduce the risk that is existing from a drought or uh, lack of resource in an uh, agriculture sector. So I, I guess um, from what I understood uh, from the question was, um, so these are options that are available as adaptation measures um, be, before we go into the conversation of losses and damages, uh, where we go into um, risk transfer and compensation. Um, and also when we are doing the risk assessments, it, this could be a component that we take into consideration because uh, when, you, when we were doing for the national communications in Sri Lanka, the risk assessments, uh, the adaptive capacity, uh, the coping capacity uh, could be increased uh, by introducing projects that relate to uh, community level or at district or national level, um, minimizing of risk 
of uh, certain indicators like the availability of water or uh, the economic value of the household being increased. So I, I think these need to be incorporated and then based on the contribution that it makes for the risk to be reduced or increased uh, through different factors and indicators, mm -hmm. the risk transfer mechanisms can benefit. Um, and then maybe we might have a lesser number of people or lesser amount of compensation that's requested because the res resilience is increased from the existing infrastructure, such as um, practices of rainwater harvesting or reservoirs that are being set up or any other thing that addresses the resource that connects with the hazard. So I, I'm just trying to link it up with uh, what we are discussing in the webinar. I hope that was helpful. Um, thank you, Vasita. And um, I'm wondering if uh, any other panelists would like to take that question as well, or if not, maybe we could move on to, uh, I would like to say the final question, so we could also then move on to group work uh, from Dr. Prabhakar to all panel members. Are the national insurance programs usually fix premiums in a blanket approach? Are there any examples of national level insurance schemes that calculate premiums at individual level? So um, maybe so we'll start off with maybe uh, Lucas, Jen, Linda, Vasita. So not that I know of, but I'm also not exactly the biggest expert on the <laughs> topic of national in, in insurance schemes. Uh, what I know from our work with African risk capacity and uh, P Creek is obviously that uh, those countries, they are paying their uh, own fair share of the premium. Um, when it comes to really um, smallholder pharma national insurance schemes, I think uh, if you want to involve parametric insurance, it would be quite doable to uh, fix the uh, premiums on a sort of regional level data. So for example, that the county in the north has a higher premium than a country in the south, uh, that would be very, very achievable, I think. And actually, I think one of the advantages of parametric insurance or integrating parametric insurance into such a national insurance scheme um, so maybe just from, from my side. Thank you, um, Jen. Um, I'm not aware of any, I would think, I mean, so the US system, which is in some ways kind of a, an income uh, insurance almost, um, because it includes price risk components as well as production risk components. I, I believe those are individually calculated premiums, but, but in terms of uh, the global south, I'm not aware of any, although um, there aren't that many well-developed uh, national systems that are operational at this time anyway. But I think it's a great um, idea in terms of kind of marrying um, or, or thinking about uh, adaptive social protection or shock responsive social protection systems where, um, where information that is used to determine eligibility for social protection could be used to um, increase rates of subsidization for certain individuals. Sorry, thanks very much. Uh, Linda, would you like to add anything to that as well? Yeah, I have more familiar, familiarity with the regional <clears throat> risk transfer um, mechanisms, um, pr probably similar to Lucas. Um, in, in, in every country um, uh, negotiates its own contract with, with the, the insurer and uh, some countries that experience more impacts are less willing to pay premiums so that their payout in, even parametrically is lower. Um, e even if they're they're experiencing more impact. So that's, you know, I wouldn't say personal choice, but a country level choice. Um, ha having said that, um, I do know a little bit about um, some of the more micro insurance programs and that I think um, UNU and others um, at least piloted a few years ago. Um, and, and those are really um, community based and not not national insurance programs. So those are really going into the communities themselves and working with the communities based on on um, you know needs and 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 um, discussions at that level and so that the national government doesn't really get involved except to sanction having people come in. So um, so I, I, I'm not exactly sure um, 
at least at, at the developing level in my own experience, and, and I think this chimes with what Jen was saying, where national insurance programs really um, are involved um, in, in those two very different um, macro sort of micro um, examples. Um, thank you very much uh, to all of the speakers and to all those who submitted questions and also shared their experiences. Um, I would also like to thank those who joined us on Facebook. Uh, we will be ending the feed now, so we could maybe want some work, uh, like interactive work. Um, also, if you haven't done it already, kindly do fill up the registration form. I will drop the link on the chat soon after this. Um, so thank you once again to all the speakers, questions, and all those who contributed. I would now like to hand it over to Dennis, who would be taking it on uh, with uh, the group work. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you uh, all, also from my side uh, to all speakers uh, and uh, like the people who asked questions. I think we had a very good discussion so far. Now we would like to open the floor to anyone else who wants uh, to contribute, not a question, but uh, an example from their work and experience, uh, any input to the questions that are on the Miro board or anything that really relates to the topic of how we can uh, have insurance schemes that are inclusive and participatory and um, address the needs of vulnerable communities of uh, all, all members of the communities also and uh, on the micro meso or micro level whichever kind of work you're doing in whichever country we have a lot of people here from all over the world so uh, yeah i would like to open the floor uh, and ask anyone of course all the speakers are very welcome to uh, contribute more uh, but also anyone else um, just unmute yourself uh, and uh, contribute anything i will Maybe check in with the my robot, which I think has been populated quite a bit. Seems to be working now. So we have a lot of um, input for the first and third question, not so much for the second one. Do we have? Maybe you can all have a look at that. But uh, again, the floor is open. Anyone who would want to add anything from your work, now would be the time. 